welcome. This is uh, the tutorial for conch. Um, if you're not here for the tutorial on conch, you're really in the wrong room. Um, <laughs> but we hope it's you're a great the, room. Yeah, yeah. We, we think this room is the best, room. actually. You so. made a good choice. <laughs> um, uh, you can introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Anthony Scopatz. I uh, work for Quantsite, and uh, according to the slide, I am both a madman and a poet. So uh, I, I hope that this inspires you in some way today. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Gil Forsyth, not Gorsyth. Um, uh, I am also a madman and a poet, according to the slide. Uh, I currently work for Capital One. Um, yeah, that's what I got. Yeah, and cool. thanks for being here with us at uh, 8 a.m. on a Monday morning. Yes. So. <laughs> not everybody <laughs> wants to learn about new show languages at 8 a.m. on Monday morning, but I'm glad you're here. Um, so we have a few bits of, uh, uh, I guess, bookkeeping, and just want to get everyone kind of set up and ready to go. Um, if you've been to a lot of, uh, or any SciPy tutorials before, uh, sort of the, um, the, the usual mode of presentation interaction is Jupyter Notebooks, and those are great. It works really badly uh, if what you're teaching is like a show language and prompt. Um, so we actually just do need you to install the stuff, and then we will um, be sort of live coding and have slides at the same time, and we're, you know, we'll be running around and helping stuff. But so if uh, all of you can just take a few moments and we'll run around um, to troubleshoot uh, and install Conch, uh, we highly recommend using Conda for this, but uh, there's other yeah, options and, there, there. and there's a new release as of last night at 10 p.m. So if you haven't updated <laughs> since then, please, uh, there, there's a bug fix. Sorry, the code has bugs, um, uh, like all code. So yeah, please grab the 0 0.9.8 release, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll go from there. So who has Conch installed right now already? Um, OK, most of you. And, and if you don't, like, just Grab it. it should take two seconds because it is pure Python, thankfully. Um, so you don't have to deal with like weird Fortran Rust extension interactions mm -hmm. and stuff. Or readline. Readline. Oh yeah, we don't have to deal with readline. No. Everyone's favorite library. Three three cheers for readline. No, 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 cheers. no, no cheers. cheers. Okay. Wow. Oh, we got one wow. cheer. Tough crowd. Yeah. One, 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 one cheer. cheer. Wow. Nice. Input RC. There you go. Uh, thank you. I'll be here all morning. What? I'm showing my age. Now. Yeah, no. It's <laughs> um, all right. So, oh, and we, we, we should send out the link to the slides as well. So, yeah, we should. Um, yeah the slides should be at uh, con.sh. What is it? This is. Um, What's that repo called? Is it like conch? Conch, scipy, something, something, yeah. Okay. Uh. Um, while people are installing uh, conch, and for people just coming into the room, please install conch. Um, I just want to sort of do a quick poll of the room, get a sense of, of who y'all are and why you're here. Um, so um, who here uses bash on a regular basis? Okay, any Z shell users? Okay, fish? One, okay, yeah, one yeah. cheer for fish, one cheer for readline, two cheers. Okay, fish got two cheers. Two, two. All right. Has anybody used Contra already? All right. Yeah, cool. One, two. Yeah, that's better than fish. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. Um, Who here really likes Bash? That's okay. No, no, there's nothing no, no, to be ashamed no, no, about. No, there's, no, a, there's an open question. We're not, we're not here to know. Who here remembers the syntax for a for loop in Bash without looking at Stack Overflow? <laughs> okay, no, no, that, some people can do that. That's totally cool. Who here remembers how to tokenize a non-white space string in Bash without looking at Stack Overflow? Bold so, I'll believe you. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, call you out there. That's, that's good. Okay. Um, so uh, while we get the slides up and ready, I mean, one of the the things that, conscious for many things. Uh, partially, it's uh, to to suit our uh, mad desires, um, but also it was a lot of these things which seem like they should be simple and easy to remember aren't. Um, and a lot of us are dealing on our daily workflows with um, language decisions from the 70s, which made a lot of sense, but maybe we don't like want there to be a difference between single and double quotes all the time, or like maybe we don't want to have that many square brackets in a row. Um, and so this is an effort to remove that pain because this should be a relatively seamless and sort of fun interaction, and you should just be able to do the things you want to do without struggling through it. All right. I think we probably can. I, I don't have the slide link, okay. unfortunately. So. Um, are people in, mostly installed and ready to go? I have conch running. 
cool. Does anybody not have contouring? That would be, I guess, the question to ask. Okay. We're still going to be talking for just a bit, so, um, and we can, we can catch up as we go. Okay. Um, also, just a quick sanity check, if you can run, uh, every time we say, like, the sound, like, co or something, it's always going to start with an X, just a fair warning. Um, so if you can run config, uh, it's X-O-N-F-I-G in your uh, conch shell. Um, that should probably not say what it says here. Maybe it should say 0 0.9.8 at the top, just so we're sure we're on, roughly speaking, the right versions. Um, I do have the link, but I don't know of a good way to get it to you guys. Other than, oh, I'll just put it here. So if you want to follow along with the uh, tutorial, um, uh, uh, you can go to this link. So it's conch.github.io, scipy-2019-tutorial, slash remote.html. We're sorry about the URL. Yeah, we're sorry. Only a little sorry, because it's pretty readable. Um, but yeah, you can click along and follow. So you can skip ahead in the slides or go back. There's some exercises and things like that. And so um, bring that up now. OK. Um, I'm sorry, I'll let you guys do that and then we'll continue. Um, okay, so uh, quickly just a, like an overview of just some things that you'll see us doing a lot and you should also feel free to do while you're interacting with the shell. Um, we don't have explicit slides about this because they're just sort of general overall like things you can do in a shell or in conch anyway. Um, but if you see us do something, like we obviously hit one key and something happens and you want to know what just happened, please just ask us if it, if it seemed like it came out of nowhere or we're not trying to make this opaque. Yeah. Um, so generally speaking, there's tab completion. Ah, oh, yes. Oh, from the um, the tutorial. There, there's an there's an L right at uh, the end. Yeah, sorry, it wrapped a little. Yeah, I was getting. Well, the directory doesn't have an index.html. I can fix that in in a moment. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, generally speaking, there's tab completion for almost everything, so um, it'll save you time when you're typing. Um, be aware of that. Um, does anyone not know what tab completion is? No, no shame. All right, All right good, great. Um, this will mean less for you at the beginning of the tutorial. There's a lot of history search functionality. You probably don't have much of a conch history at the moment, so that won't mean that much. But um, there are several ways to search up. Um, we'll kind of touch on those a little bit later. Control R is your friend. That will kind of give you a, an anywhere uh, line search back in your history. If you start typing a command, you can press up and it will do a prefix search match. So like anything that's, any line that started with that initial bit will show up in the results as you arrow up. Um, and you'll see this sort of ghost text showing up if you're typing the same command, this sort of um, history match autocomplete thing. And you can just hit right arrow or I think control E to sort of expand out to that if you want. Don't worry about like taking all that in at once, but we'll, we'll come back to it. Um, ah, yes. Um, for all the uh, Pythonic bits in conch, and we'll find out what those are a little bit later, um, you can always uh, append a question mark to a command, and it will bring up a little uh, help screen in the pager, or you can do a double question mark for super help um, for even more. If you've used IPython a fair bit, this will maybe be a familiar uh, pattern. Yes. I don't think there is one. It's oh. UT guest. UT guest, UT and it should just be an open, wide open network. Okay. Yeah. Is there another question over here? Or? Okay. Well, I, I think the SSH doesn't work on the UT guest network. Is that I, what I think it is? we did Some, discover that, yeah. Someone posted something on the Slack general channel on using two factor authentication to get around that. Okay. Yeah, okay. Cool. Not going to do that live. We are going to ask everyone about questions about that during the break so we can fix something that wasn't working. And that'd be, but that's good news. Awesome. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay, great. All right. Um, so, yeah, there's, oh, was there a question?
question? No. All right, so everyone has conch working. The conf if you ran the, sorry, uh, the config, oops, let me just go into the, oops. Oh, let's see. Okay, so you should have been able to run the config command and see some output like this. So if, if, is everyone kind of at that stage? The co oh yeah, it's it's config with an X. You're gonna love that X key in the next four hours. All right, um, okay. So we've got our agenda here. We'll be taking some breaks in between these things, and we're gonna be building up to sort of greater and greater capability over the time. These are links, so if you have the slides up, uh, you can jump around if you want to. Um, and there are exercises at the end of each little section. So. Um, oops, yep, that's uh, going to do the shuffle here. <laughs> um, so conch is a superset of Python 3. So what that means is that all of the syntax that's in Python is also valid conch, right? So there's no, so if you know Python pretty well or really well or extremely well, everything should be familiar to you. Um, and so you can do a bunch, like basically everything that you would be able to do in Python, right? Like define classes, functions, modules, etc. Um, so we can go ahead and uh, you know do these along with us, like you know uh, when they come up. So let's try some of them out. Oh, these are our first exercises actually. So the the first one is to compute the product of two, three, and seven. Um, the second one is to import NumPy or import sys if you don't have, happen to have NumPy installed. Um, and then also define a function. You can do the, all this right at the command line. You don't need to go anywhere else. You, you don't need to do this, this in a file. So um, try these out. You can click on the details to get the answer. Um, and we'll give you guys a couple of minutes to, to try this stuff out. So. And I'll also be solving it very slowly in real time. <laughs> I think you can go. <laughs> wow, 42. What, a, what an auspicious number there. My goodness. <laughs> can we import a module, Gil? Yes. Wow. That's, that's pretty impressive. What, does it think of random numbers? Oh, we're in read line. We I'm should probably. Read line, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I've marked that up. Nope, all still in read line. Are you doing that random start thing again? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay. <laughs> Somebody just don't close this one. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I was in uh, developer mode right there. So, um, there we go. So you're saying, um, yeah, you should see there's a lot of tab completions available. So if you import, uh, or I'll do sys actually too, because that's one that works. So you can just hit tab after the dot, and those will be all of the attributes and modules that are available in sys. Yep. I forgot the last one. The function. Oh, cool. Um, does anyone have any problems or questions with these? Pretty simple, right? So this is just to prove to you that conch really is Python. Yes. Yes, you can. We'll, we will, well, we will get to that question later. <laughs> um, so Darhas's question, for those of you who uh, are listening at home, was can you define a function that's all a command on your system? And the answer is yes. And we'll get to how all that resolves and works later. So um, great question. OK. And we'll get to it pretty soon, I think, actually. <laughs> um, so conch is a shell. So conch is also a shell language. Um, or more, more precisely, it's really a scripting language that is mostly SH lang compatible, which if you go back to like the 60s and 70s, you know, SH uh, was this old, or is a shell language that we all have inherited a la Bash and, and Z shell and, and, other, and other languages like that. Um, but unfortunately, it's actually impossible. The syntax is collide, and it's impossible to be both a Python and SHLang compatible language. Um, 
And so you have to kind of choose. And in conch, we have chosen that Python will always win. Um, there's a couple reasons for this, uh, but mostly it's that Python is a sane language and uh, SH is not really sane in some ways, like the splitting s strings on non-white space characters and the machinery for how all that stuff works is kind of crazy if you dig into how the SH langs work. Um, but c Python always wins, so if you found a place where Python syntax isn't working, uh, that is a bug. <laughs> and you should please report that. Should we do an LS dash L? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure, sure we so can. So just as an example of this, there's issues um, where, uh, so this is a command that you may be familiar with. Um, but this is also a valid Python syntax if LS and L are you know, defined. So uh, right. So. The, the rule is, if, is that if one of those things isn't defined, it'll still function, right? And you can just delete the variables, but it is possible to overwrite those um, built-in names. Yeah. yeah, and there's a way to escape that, which yeah. will, th this is just a convenience, but that we'll get to in, in a bit here. Um, so the purpose of a shell is to run commands, obviously. Um, and so we've got some commands here, right? So uh, we just saw ls-l, uh, simple one, yeah, please type, you know, type this out if you, if you want, just prove it to yourself um, that this works. You can do echo. Uh, you can make directories um, and CD into those directories, touch files, uh, do all the kinds of normal things that you, uh, you, would, you would want to do. So, and I think I actually have all the, the test code here still. But, um, and the other thing that you can do is you can pipe, right? So if you're uh, familiar with piping from other shell languages, you can take the output um, from one command and, and make that the input to another. And so that all works normally like you would expect in conch as well. So, and basically under, uh, under the covers, this is a horrible abuse of the subprocess module, uh, as you would expect, uh, with a lot of fancy features added to it. So, um, okay, so the next bit of kind of basic syntax in the language is, are environment variables. So these function a little differently than other sh langs, but Similarly, so you can refer to any environment variable by prefixing a name with the dollar sign character. So if you want to look up, right, if you want to look up a variable in the environment, you can say dollar sign that variable name, and then you'll get back the result. So, right, so the, the environment is this like special namespace that processes use to communicate with each other, and uh, conch gives you access to that. Um, uh, and you can set and delete environment variables uh, more like you would do in Python than you would do in other shell languages, right? So these are just normal variables that happen to live in a special dictionary mapping somewhere. Um, and so because of that, you, you would set them with an equal sign and then you would delete them with the del operator. So shouldn't be anything uh, too out of the ordinary there. Anyone have any questions about that? Uh, is there any difference between this and OS environment, OS.environment? And the answer is yes, there's a lot. We'll get to that in a section coming up. Um, and yeah. So I have two questions. The first one is will export still work for environment variables? No. Export is not a feature of conch. Or so exporting, uh, so okay, this is, a, this is getting into the weeds a bit. But I think export is a, is a bad idea. You shouldn't need to explicitly export things, right? You're already doing that with the dollar sign, right? So sh langs, when, when you export or when you define an exported variable, you actually don't put the dollar sign. So we've collapsed those seven characters, export plus space, into just the dollar sign. So we can assume these variables are full. They're, well, they're, not, they're, they're process wide. Yeah, they go into the environment for the process. Uh, oh, so dollar zero uh, for those. So the question is, what about dollar zero? Dollar uh, zero is how you refer to arguments, or you get your the command that you run. Uh, we use dollar args for that uh, when you're running a script. It's an environment variable. It's in the docs, which we'll have a link for very shortly. So, um, okay. Oh, I just realized this uh, screen. We're standing in front of it. But that's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But we'll maybe fix that during the break. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, these pretty normal. Um, 
the other thing that you can do is you can do environment, ver or environment lookup with Python expressions using dollar sign curly brace. So if you want to com compute uh, an environment variable um, arbitrarily, you can, you can use dollar sign curly brace. So this is a little different than how other languages do it. Uh, but for example, say you have an X variable that equals a string in your namespace or your user. Um, you can do dollar sign curly brace X, and then that'll look up the user environment variable. So that looks up the name. Um, whoops. Uh, sorry, I skipped ahead a bit. And, or if you want to compute it with some other, uh, some other expression. You can just stick that right in there. Um, in most SH links, these are actually dollar sign and dollar sign curly brace are the same, have effectively the same meaning, uh, but they have distinct meanings here. Effectively, they're, they're subtle differences, I know. Um, but they're very different here. Okay, uh, the source command. So is everyone, is everyone familiar with source in other languages, like bash and things? Okay, yeah, so, so if you're not, what source does is source takes a file that's written in that language. So if you're in bash and you, so, you can source a bash file and it will run the commands as if you had typed them into that session. So it's just a shortcut for executing everything in a file in, in your current uh, interpreter session. Um, so conch, the source command does roughly, the, does basically the same thing. It reads in the contents of a file, and then it executes them, and it brings all the variable, all the glo global variables and everything in the environment, et cetera, into the current execution context. Um, but of course, this doesn't work on bash. This works on conch code. Um, so if you have a very simple uh, example file, oh, yeah, sorry, this is, yeah, oh, you can do that. Um, uh, so here, what we have is we're setting an environment variable in this file. Um, we're setting a password, which is a terrible thing to do. Uh, and then we're defining a function. Oh, you can install Vim right now if you want. Go for it. <laughs> see if I care, Gil. Just, just. Yeah, I can't do that to your laptop. It just seems mean. How do I do this? Uh, well, I mean, we're talking about sharing passwords, so I'll just say my my root That's password okay. out right now. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, <laughs> um, oops. Yeah, so you can, uh, you can then use this function and it, it's, it's scoped. So basically what you do to use source is you just say source and then the file name. So here's source example.xsh. And then uh, you'll see that, that those variables that we had, like uh, dollar sign email, are available, as well as um, the combined function has been brought into your local or your current session's execution context, and you can, you can run it. Um, uh, you can also import at .xsh files uh, as well. So if you want to write Python modules as, uh, as conch files, you're totally welcome to do that. And you can import them even in no other normal Python projects. I'm not going to show that here, but if you're interested, that's something you can do. OK. Any questions on source? Pretty simple. All right. Um, the thing that you can't do in a lot of other languages that you can do in conch is that we have a notion of sourcing files from other shell languages that we call source foreign. Um, so imagine you have some bash script somewhere and you want to bring that in and execute that in conch and, and bring all the things into your local execution context. You're able to do that just by saying source bash and then the bash script. So if you've got a you know a hundred thousand lines of Z shell, well one I'm sorry, and two, um, you can still use that. So this is a way to integrate, to slowly integrate um, with other languages, um, which is uh, pretty cool actually. So uh, it's pretty nice. Any and and by default, sorry, uh, we have a so source foreign is a generic infrastructure for doing this, um, but we have shortcuts for doing source bash source Z shell, and also source command, or CMD. So if you're on Windows, using the Windows batch processing language, you can source that stuff too, um, which is madness, but. The, how, yeah. how long does Conch work on Windows? I mean, we've got a core Windows developer for the past four years who's like, 
it works pretty well. I mean, there's, I imagine there's folks here using it on Windows, right? So. Are there any Windows users in the room, actually? Yeah. Okay, cool. Let it, I mean, who are on Windows right now? <laughs> okay. no, awesome. no, please, please let us know how it's going. I mean, like, sure. seriously, I'm, I, I think that the biggest problems are, are usually just that our examples are very like Unixy, and so we say like run this command, and it's like what command is that? That's that's often the problem. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, so we found with that, like, if you're on a base Windows install and you just install git bash, then you get all the Unixy yeah. commands and everything works normally. And supposedly it works really well on Windows subsystem for Linux, but I have not tested that. I mean, you can. We would yeah. be very happy for you to do that. <laughs> yeah. We may not be able to help if it goes wrong, but we'll try. Yeah. Uh, I saw another question over here somewhere. All right. Okay, so source foreign, uh, really nice capability, really helpful, especially if you're just getting started. Um, the other thing, like most, uh, like most shell languages, we've got a configuration file that lives in home.conchrc. Uh, um, and this is just a particular special XSH file and that's loaded before basically everything else is loaded. So this is where you can stick all of your customizations. Um, it, mostly a lot of people just stick environment variables in there. Um, uh, if you're a Conda user, Conda as activate or whatever init will throw some stuff in there as well. Um, and yeah, so, uh, but basically, if you wanna read about all of the customizations, they're, on, they're in the doc, so every, Every environment variable that we touch has documentation associated with it. And there's a lot of like tweaks that you can do if you, if you need to. All right. Uh, so here's some more exercises. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a, a few minutes to do these. So the first one is to just set a random integer to the environment variable dollar sign secret. Um, the next is to print the secret value. Um, and then uh, the third is to put uh, a generating, uh, some generating code for that secret value into your conch RC uh, when conch starts up if a dollar sign safe variable does not exist. So we'll give you guys a couple, we'll give you all a couple moments to, uh, to try this out. And if anyone's having problems, just raise your hands right now and, and uh, Gil and I will, will walk around and help. The next thing, the, or for problem for part two, there's actually a couple different ways to do this. Um, the first is that you could either echo that. So if you're thinking more in a shell language, you could echo that. Uh, you know, my secret value is dollar sign secret as a string, and that will all uh, all push out normally. Or if you're in more of a Python mode, you can just print it like you would print anything else. Okay. Uh, both of those are totally valid. Um, and then the last one is if you wanted to, oops, this is getting cut off, I guess, but <laughs> um, this is why you have it on uh, your own machines too. Um, you can say uh, in your conch RC, you, because it's Python, you can import random. Because it's conch, you can set the environment variable um, to whatever random value. And then, oh, we actually, didn't cover this syntax in this exercise, but because um, uh, we've moved around some slides, but uh, we'll get back to that last one soon enough. So, what is that? Okay, so very briefly. Um, so remember how we said dollar sign uh, curly brace is an expression? Uh, you can you do look up by expression. So the this dot 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 in Python is the special is the syntax for the ellipsis object. Um, so we use that. NumPy uses it too. Um, so we use that to be a, a reference to the environment itself. So if you do dollar sign curly brace dot dot dot, you get back the environment object because dot 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 is obviously not or an ellipsis is obviously not any environment variable, um, and it's a big mess, uh, which is why we didn't want to cover it this soon. But there it is. And uh, we'll, we will get back to it in a bit. OK. So yeah, the goal here is like, because it's just a mapping, you can test if, if things are in the environment uh, through, through the self lookup. OK. 
Uh, wow, a break already? That can't be right. No, probably not. Okay, so we're not gonna break yet, because it's too early. I built up your hopes and then and crushing me, and cr <laughs> just crushing them right now. Um, crushing it, yeah. Uh, okay, so Gil's gonna take over for this next part. And maybe, yeah. Okay. I'm not gonna move this one. Cause yeah, it's yeah, it's impossible. Okay. Okay, so um, we've sort of looked at, you can still run um, sort of a sub-process command, like a regular, term, a regular terminal command, shell command, um, and you can also run um, Python you know, modules and functions, and you can sort of you know, uh, set them to environment variables and then use that. But um, where this really starts to come into play is when you want to be able to start mixing those two things together to sort of get the best, best of both worlds. Um, so the idea here is that in a lot of ways, Conch just makes up using subprocess really, really simple. Uh, instead of trying to remember, like, wait, you set this like subprocess.pipe thing somewhere, and how are you going to like parse the output and all that? We just all that's being handled for you in sort of a more intuitive way. Um, and we have a number of operators we have added to sort of help with this interaction between sort of subprocess mode and Python mode. Um, so the first of these is a dollar curly brace. Um, parentheses. Parentheses, yes, sorry. I do remember what keys are, um, sort of. Um, and what it does, uh, actually similar to bash, is it captures the output of a command, but then it returns it as, it returns it as a string. Um, and it really does return the whole string, right? So it, you know, um, the output of ls has a bunch of uh, line breaks in it, so there are a bunch of line breaks in the output. Uh, what that means is that if you print it, you actually get what the output of that was. Um, similarly, it, it is a, um, it's a string, right, like a Python string. So if you type, you know, x dot and then hit tab or something, or just, uh, like, you have all of the Python string methods available to you. So if you wanted to split that, say, on new lines, which might be a useful thing to do with ls, or you really like uppercase letters uh, and you want to do that, or however you want to um, mutate and parse and change that captured output, all of, sort of Python's built-in helpers are already there for you. You don't need to sit there and like try to write these things yourself. Cool. Okay. So uh, the second is uh, bang parens. Um, and uh, this does the same thing and then also other stuff. Um, so it, what it actually is returning, if you run a command with this, is a, a command pipeline object, which is a sort of a, a, a conch thingy. Um, and it includes the output of the command as well, but also a bunch of information about like, uh, like the PID of the process, what the return code was, what the actual argument you ran was, if it was an alias, what did it expand out to, what are the starting, stopping timestamps of that command. Um, and also, um, this object itself is truthy. So if the return code is a success, then you can actually say, like, you know, if bang this command, you know, like, paren this command, and if, it, if it's successful, then that, you can use that for control flow. So there's sort of a way to easily um, figure out, like, I tried to do this thing. Was it successful, yes or no? What was the output if it was successful? How long did it take? Like, all of this is just available to you in sort of the, the, the command pipeline object that's returned. I think this is what I just said, yeah. I didn't do a fail command, but that's okay. That's all right. Does anybody have any questions about those? That bam then interferes with the negative condition, right? Um, yes, in some, although in Python it's a tilde, yeah? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So in, in Python, if you wanted to negate something, you use not or tilde, or tilde is the invert operator, but yeah. Oh yeah, also, so you can um, iterate over the output of these commands line by line. Um, in, in bang exclamation point. Yes. Oops. In enumerate ls, and then print, uh, what, what is it, f string? Mm -hmm. And then just i and loc. Oh, probably 
probably should have stripped Luke, but that's... That's okay. That's okay. We can do it next time. Yeah. Or this time. <laughs> For example. Right, so the new lines are still in that loc, uh, in that object, that loc object that, that ends up there. Um, and this is streaming, by the way. So that if you wanted to stream through your command, right, if you've got output that's larger than memory, this is how you would, you would use uh, bang parentheses for, for that, so. Um, also on the list of things that we may have not mentioned, um, there is this uh, multi-line prompt thing that keeps happening that we've just sort of been using without uh, mentioning. Um, but yeah, so it's like in the same way that IPython functions, um, this is a, uh, a full, you can just keep, you know, as long as you're, uh, you can either shift re return to uh, maintain, like to force a new line, but you, as long as the command isn't complete, it'll just keep adding a new line for you to type on two enters at the end will run the thing, and then when you arrow up through your history, it will load up the full command, like the full command block for you. You don't need to like go and hit arrow up for each of those individual lines you were doing. Right, so, so I just hit button. arrow up there once, and it returned the whole input. Yeah. So, an arrow down returns it back. So, yeah. okay, All right. yeah, thanks. Great. Um, so we just went over, those are captured sub-processes, and then there are uncaptured sub-processes. So um, here again, uh, we're using a dollar sign and bang, but this time using square braces. Um, and they function the same way as the captured ones, except they, they don't capture. Um, and so the output of the command still goes through to the screen to standard out or standard error, depending. But you can still capture that um, metadata along with it. Um, so in the case of uh, dollar sign square braces, um, it always returns none, actually. Um, and so uh, this is um, more for uh, forcing subprocess mode, where the context may be a little ambiguous. And you want to say, like, don't try to interpret this as Python. Just run this as a command instead. Um, the uh, bang uh, uh, bracket there. Um, so the output gets streamed to standard out still. So you see it, and it would, it would run as if you just ran the command regularly. But uh, at the same time, um, similar to the information from the uh, capture subprocess about the you know uh, starting and stopping times, the arguments that were passed in, if it was successful or not, all of that is returned um, as a result of that uh, operator. So you can have the output still kind of like showing in front of you, but still be operating on sort of you know um, what were the conditions of that command? Did it execute successfully? Should I stop? Should I continue? Right. So you get this rich command pipeline object back out that you can manipulate. And this particular bit of syntax is the thing that really underlies a lot of conch. Um, so the, what's actually happening, so if you just run ls here, what conch is doing is it's secretly adding in uh, a bang square bracket around that ls. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK. Yeah. OK, right column tight, good. Oh, OK, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, now uh, the, the, we, there, um, just, I would suggest we just take a few moments and just to play with each of these a little bit to get a, a handle on them. Um, this is basically the end of like new syntax that we're going to introduce largely. Wait, except for one big one that's coming up. Um, but just to kind of get a sense like, of, of how they work, make sure that uh, they match your expectations, like you know, which, what should be captured, what shouldn't be captured. How do you um, interact with the attributes of these return command pipeline objects? Uh, what is in there? Um, is there something you would like to be in there that's not? We can talk. Um, you can definitely work on that. Um, and just as a general uh, mnemonic for this, because it's you know, a bunch of stuff, I've sort of come up with like curly captures and square streams. Um, and it's a, a bit misleading because it's all sort of streaming in one sense. But like, if you want output to not show up, use the curly things. If you do want it to show up, use the square things. Does, uh, does anyone have any questions about this stuff? No, we just threw a lot at you. Yeah, back there. Mm -hmm. uh, almost. So bang square bracket prints it, but does save it to the variable. And then bang, cur bang parentheses prints it, but then doesn't save it to the variable. I know, yeah. So basically what, what's going on here is that um, dollar sign uh, parentheses returns a string, right? It doesn't print it. But if we wanted to stream that, so we use bang, what should that return? Oop. Command pipeline. Sorry, 
sorry. Uh, is, that, is that right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so what should that return? None, right? Because, oh, no, it's not none. Yeah. Well, did I do something wrong? Here? Yeah. What did I do? The, 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 you... LS. No, not no. LS dot. Oh, it's still, maybe it's that it's like when you do a sign. No, that's still the thing, so. Oh, no, sorry. Haha, ha. I did this wrong. Um, yeah. So if you do dollar sign, if you change these to square brackets because you want to stream, because square brackets kind of look like pipes, um, uh, that should return none rather than a string because there's, no, there's nothing to return. Um, you're already, the, 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 co the output that's coming in has already, ha already been consumed and printed. And so it's been streamed and there's nothing left to return. Um, uh, the, uh, which is why you see like, because we did this is none, uh, we actually got this, we got this true printed behind us, uh, even because the, the command actually printed, right? We didn't capture it. Um, if you wanted to capture it, um, or if you wanted to do, you know, bang parentheses, the bang is what gives you the object back. Um, and whether it's streaming or not is determined based on whether it's square brackets or not. Yeah, so, so the, the way to think about it, this is dollar sign returns strings. Um, and uh, bang will return something else. And then square brackets, uh, or in parentheses, will capture, and square brackets will stream. 90, yeah. So what is then the difference between um, bang with uh, square brackets and just typing the ls command? Uh, there, is, there is functionally no difference between bang with square brackets and bang with uh, and, and just typing the ls command, except in ambiguous cases. So in cases where you have both a Python function and a system command with the same name, or a Python variable and a system command with the same name, like say I just said echo equals wow or something, right? If I now went to run like echo hello world, well, that'll work because the syntax is not ambiguous. But like, let's say I went to write like um, echo like dash, uh, uh, what, what's another? Echo minus echo, for example, which would be to totally normal. Well, okay, that, but we, like, we would want to print minus echo, right, in a normal, in, in a normal shell. But both of these are variables. And so if you need to, you can always explicitly put it in bang square brackets, and then it'll run. So it's like an escape from sort of the Python. Yeah, so there, there's two things going on here. So, or there, there's one thing going on here, one or two. So there's, <laughs> there's many depends, things going though. on. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you're observing it, there are two, and then. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's complicated. Uh, basically, what's happening is uh, there's a formal conch language that always uses bang square bracket, okay? Um, and then we have uh, what we call, so there's, there's a context-free grammar that we use that always uses the square brackets. Then we do this context-aware grammar munging. So we know, because we know what's on your, what commands are available and what your execution context is, we can, we actually go back and rewrite the AST of your code in such a way that we think it will execute uh, before we try to execute it. And that's what's going on. Um, and so if you need to, you can always go to the formal grammar. And you can even turn that off uh, in, the, in the exec, we're definitely not doing that in this tutorial, but you can turn that off and make sure it's always formal. Um, that's a terrible way to live because you always have to type this bang exclamation point, and the whole idea behind conch is to make the things as easy as possible and match what your brain thinks it should be doing. Like your brain thinks, you know, ls-l should be a command, and it, just because 
that's not a Python variable doesn't mean it shouldn't be a it sh shouldn't be something that works. And so we have a lot of like heuristics that are relatively simple that get get you incredibly far. Um, and but but if those heuristics fail for some reason, which they are they it's very very infrequent. You can always go back to the formal grammar. So. Yeah, I should maybe say curves. Ca mnemonics are hard. Yeah. So, um, so the curly braces are for like with the dollar curly braces for like an environment lookup or for accessing the environment. Um, whereas these are more uh, just general, like capturing a command that you're running and capturing the output of it. Right. So this looks up a variable in the environment, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, rather than, um, yeah, rather than uh, uh, running a command. So, yeah. So, uh, I, what happens is shadowing. So, like, the, when I type ls equals one and then ls minus l, it doesn't do the thing that I, it doesn't do, I would expect that to throw an error, right? So, okay, so, so the question, so the question is, what uh, what's going on here? So you're saying ls equals. LS, if, I says, if I set it as a variable, uh -huh. it acts like a variable. So if you say ls equals one here, sure. okay, and then you say ls, my, then you were saying ls. If I do ls minus l, uh huh. It does ls minus l with an error. Right. So why does this happen? Well, this happens because l is not a variable in your Python context. If you just do ls and then we dot it, right? This is a ls itself is just the integer one, right? The 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 bang square brackets are capturing the whole thing. So, so set l to one. So yeah. So if I set l equal to one, and I do ls minus l, you'll get zero because they're both variables. What, what LS be? Python always wins, right? right. So the Python, the Python context always wins. Yeah. Your system is whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. All right. <laughs> uh, okay. Having thoroughly confused everyone, I think <laughs> now we can just take a few minutes for people just to play around with these a little more, get a sense of what's capturing and what's not, what comes back from these commands, what's returned and what's printed. Um, just to build up a little familiarity with it, and then we'll continue on. And feel free to raise hands, and we can either circulate or just answer from the podium. And we can fix this uh, curly captures thing, probably. Yeah, I guess. Mnemonics. <laughs> Is anyone having issues with their system still, or, or installing, or anything? Uh, yeah. Or do you want me to come over? Just really quickly, we had a question about um, for people who have used uh, VI mode in terminals or in shells before and want to do that, you can do that. You just need to set VI mode equals true. Yeah, and then you can uh, bounce around your current line using, you know, zero G, whatever. Yep, and then it'll just load it by default. Yeah. Okay. All right, so. I think, uh, Gil, you want to take it away? I will take it away. Um, are there any uh, lingering questions from our, our personal explorations? Great. <laughs> you can also ask us later. That's fine. Yeah, that's totally yeah. Um, So the, I, I think this is really the last bit of new syntax we're going to introduce, but I, I could be wrong. I'm wrong. But for a while, it'll be fine. Um, so this is the, uh, the Python mode operator. Um, so we've been talking for the last bit about how you um, kind of capture subprocess output and then you know turn it into either like a Python string or this command pipeline object and then how you can play around with it and inspect it and uh, do things with it. Um, but um, the uh, the at paren operator lets you go the other way. It lets you insert things from your Python sort of scope or environment into uh, a subprocess command. Um, so what we mean is generally conch's um, like parsing is pretty clever at this stuff. So if you give it, for instance, this command, like for 
something in range two and then just run echo high underneath that, it will do the right thing, right? You can put your like echo or ls or whatever subprocess command you want in the body of a for loop, and it will just execute as many times as you tell it to do. And you don't need to do anything special. That actually just works, right? Um, what does not just work is if you do this. Um, so you want to instead, you know, iterate over the value in the for loop and have it be printed. Um, you just get i twice, right? So because it runs that command twice. Um, and so what the at parentheses operator does, it lets you um, capture that Python variable and insert it into that command. Um, so what it does, it, what it's actually doing is it's, it's evaluating an arbitrary Python expression and then returning that value as a string. And that can be fed into the subprocess command, in this case, echo. Um, and if the output is not a string, uh, in case of like lists or sets, um, it just gets joined and returned as a string. So that's what that would well, look like. So it's a little different than that, actually. It, sorry to, to womp womp. womp, womp. Um, each element of the string is actually getting passed in as, as its own argument to the command. So each of these are their own command arguments. So, and it, it's just that echo happens to join them together. Thanks for uh, closing the door. We're going to close no, it. That's a good idea. Any questions about this syntax or what it's doing? Yeah. So if you didn't use echo, you said echo joined them together. If you use something else, what would it look like? Yeah, so uh, like if we did ls, ls would try to search for all of these files individually. So it's running it on each. Yeah, it's running it for, for each, yeah. Because ls takes a big argument list like that. How does it know when it can iterate and when it can't? Uh, if it's iterable so. and not a string. <laughs> okay. Right? Yeah. The normal way? Okay. So, yeah. Just to clarify, uh, echo here and ls, they both got called once. Yes. And, yep. That's what LS does. Yeah. Yeah. It's just passing each Python thing in as its, as its own, each element of the list in as its own argument or tuple or whatever. So. So it's essentially echo 012. Yes, exactly. It's, a, it's essentially echo 012 or echo, you know, uh, or LS 012. Oh, yeah. So if the result of um, the operator 2 is in the first position, it gets treated as an alias. So you can actually have this execute commands. Probably, like, not something don't, you want to do. Don't, don't do this. My, like, it's, a, it's a really bad pattern, but it, it does that. So. Right, but this is, th 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 this is different because if you, oh, I've got uh, my my traceback printing on. But you can see um, if you try to just print this, uh, or if you try to run it without splitting, that is treated as the command, the name of the command, spaces included. And so then it can't find the command, because hello, uh, com hello there, echo hello there is not a valid command. Right. OK. Your promise for more syntax is already broken. You just, <laughs> should just stop. I'm going to stop saying it now. Um, so with apologies, um, um, so you can wrap a regular expression in backticks. Um, and what it will do is return a list of every file or you know, thing in, that, in a directory that matches that regular expression as a list. Um, um, and it's a Python list, which means you can um, iterate over it. You can, uh, you know, like stick it in uh, list comprehension and, you know, like mutate all the names. Um, 
And you can actually do even more stuff with these things as you kind of go along. Um, if uh, you're, oh, sorry, yes. Yeah. So, um, which version, which kind of regex is this? Like the it's the Python regex, yeah. Yeah, it's just the RE module. Yeah, just a handy way to get into re.compile. No, no, these are not globs. Dot, dot star is a regex. Yeah. A glob would just be star. Mm -hmm. So that would be any, uh, any dots and then XSH. Yeah, anything. And so we could, uh, maybe a better example would be, um, what's a, uh, <laughs> 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 looking at you. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so we've got some pings in here, right? So like, what if we wanted to, if we wanted to like uh, grab, uh, I guess we don't have a lot with um, anything uh, with. I want, I want PNGs that have the letter zero, the letter O in them. Yeah, so like, that's right, yeah. So do uh, dot star O dot star uh, dot, or yeah. slash dot PNG. Um, but also regular expressions are hard. So if you, if you wanted to use globs, let's just say somebody had mentioned that, um, <laughs> then you can prefix the back ticks with the G, um, and then it is glob matching. So you don't need to do the dot thing, that's just, you know, like star.md, star.png, star whatever. Um, and as an extra special bonus in Python, I think 3.6 and above, um, this supports recursive globbing the way that, um, uh, the, the glob library does. So if you do like a star star slash star dot md, that will recursively glob through the entire directory structure from where you are and find every single markdown file in that whole chunk. This can take a long time. Like, be, like use this, you know, like if you'd run find at your root and it takes forever, like same thing. Um, but it's uh, really, really handy for finding all of the sort of files or patterns matching something in a, in a large area. Any questions on this before Sorry, we yes. go on? All right. I'm, curi I'm curious as to the use cases uh, that led you guys to create all of these operators. Yeah, so um, it, we can't. We can't, oh, I, I, I'll say, so the question is like, what are the use cases that led us to create all these things? And just as a, as a, as a general like conch creation story, Almost everything in here is something we were like, you know what we really need to do, thing we need to do today is this thing. And then we did that. Um, so they, they were all created from actual, and us and other contributors, people who were like, I really need this to do thing X. Um, and then what we discovered along the way is that a lot of it tied in together really well without, ex without us having to do anything extra. Uh, we'll come up on some of that stuff around the way, some of the, the string matching and string literals work. Um, yeah, so like one thing I just showed, for the globs in particular, right, like being able to loop through a glob list is, it, with this syntax is a lot nicer, Yeah. right? Yeah. We're doing that a lot. Yeah. So at what point do you switch between writing a script and conch to just writing a Python module with a CLI? Like, is that a size? Uh, so it, yeah, so the the question is about trading off between Python module CLI and writing something in conch. For me, it's a really about how much you're hammering subprocess. So if you're interacting with subprocess a lot, uh, like do not write it in a Python CLI. Write write it in conch. Um, if you want some of these extra fancy features, um, like you really just want to be able to glob tick things like very quickly or you want to like search through whatever then like do you know do it in conch as well that that's my kind of there, we'll see some other syntax later where there's conch specific things but at this point it's kind of like if you're doing a ton of like basically scripting you know like then you should be using conch because it's actually meant as a scripting language unlike python do you have examples of like CSD pipelines and stuff that you've written oh yeah yeah, yeah. Well, we can talk about those afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. Yeah. For for people who work at a certain institution, they can also use all my internal ones. Just saying. <laughs> like, sorry, everyone else. I'll show you other things, but um, yeah. Uh, Tom, I think you're next. Can I import conch and grab some of the stuff directly in Python? Yes. Okay. Yep. So the question is, can you import conch code and use some of this stuff in Python? I mean, like, can I import something like if I just want the this like 
nice. Some of this like string matching. Can I do like conch dot? Give me the list of files and have it. Do so we don't have a, a so yes ish. <laughs> we we haven't we have we don't have that particular use case lined out so much, but. Um, so I would say there are two things there. Uh, so one, we have uh, a quote unquote standard library where we have sort of extensions and updates to standard library things to make it easier. So you can do like import conch.lib.os and you get some like, like you get a remove tree that actually works on all platforms. And you get like, uh, if you do like sub process, you get a version of run that uses our thing and returns a command pipeline object. Um, and you can also just get an executor back, and then you can like like you would run conch code, and you're like you would run Python code through a normal like exec thing, and you can do that. That might not be what you want exactly, um, but I like the way your brain is thinking. So maybe we should talk more about that uh, afterwards. Yeah. yeah. So, and there was another question back there. I think. Yeah. Yeah, in, Re in regex, if, right, so it's just a normal, um, it, you just have to do, right, like say, let me just go back to my home directory. So the question is about uh, how do you get uh, your dot files with a regex? Well, uh, you just do backslash dot, which is the regex, uh, regex escape character for uh, the dot character. So the, oops, let me go back up and show you. Apparently, I've got a lot of configuration going on. Uh, uh, so Gosh, you would do. We, <laughs> Anthony. Don't tell anyone. Um, uh, yeah, I'm secretly a bash user. Uh, uh, the, so you would do backslash dot and then dot star to match anything, right? So the, the backslash dot is a literal period. Uh, so I would argue that it's more sane than a uh, lot. So the question is about history. How does conch deal with multi-terminal history? So conch sort of cribs from the Jupyter playbook a bit. So uh, by default, all of your history is stored per session in a JSON file in the standard like configuration location. So you can go back and get each session's history. And then the, the terminal application itself will present that to you in whatever nice way it needs to. Uh, you can also switch to a SQLite history backend if you want to store a SQLite. Uh, there is tons of, there, there's basically as much metadata as you want in the, in the history. And that's very configurable through environment variables. Not gonna go through that yeah. right now, but. Yes. I would say like that was the thing that, that sold me on conch initially was like I was trying to figure out how I'd compiled a certain version of Petsy and I couldn't remember which environment variables I had set when I ran the thing and like you can't figure it out. You look at your bash history and like, well, it was one of these seven because then you know you do this in conch. You're like, oh, it was, it was this term, it was this session when I ran this thing and the tests passed. Those are all the environment variables I need because they're just in one self-contained file. So. Okay. Do you have a question over here? Yeah, sorry, is there any important alias? Yes, yes. If, if you run source bash, you'll get the aliases from bash. Yeah. With one caveat, you might have actually seen this pop up on the screen, which is that if there are, uh, there are collisions in certain aliases, and also there are things, Z Shell especially does this, they have like their own built-ins, and if the alias refers to those built-ins, we don't pull them in because it'll just break when you try to run it, because it's gonna look for a command that doesn't exist. Can I get the history of a bash into? Um... There's, I think there's some experimental support. Yes. Some people have done that, that um, but yeah. I don't use it, so, yeah. but yeah, there are people who do that. We're so. happy to help try to figure that out, though. Yeah. Well, I am anyway. Yeah. Um, okay, move on, but um, cool. So, um, next up, this is not new syntax for conch anyway, but it's for Python. So, um, uh, formatted string literals are great, um, and they're part of Python, which means if you are running conch on Python 3.6 or higher, which you should be, um, then they just work. Um, and they're really fantastic. If you haven't played with these, I think they're like they're my favorite, like simple thing that should have always been there. I think um, I really enjoy them. 
uh, and yeah, the way they work, if you have a, a, a variable defined, then instead of doing a dot format or doing like the you know, parentheses you know, argument, you can just uh, have a string prepended with an F, you wrap curly braces around the variable and it just gets evaluated at you know, that time and then prints the results. So it's very handy. Um, there, um, we also have a thing that is not in Python which is called a path string literal. Um, and this, uh, if you prepend a string with a P and then you have a quote, what it returns is a uh, pathlib path object of the string that's there. So for instance, if you were, oh, I went the wrong way. If you do like path equals thing, you get a, you know, on, on Linux you get a POSIX path, on Windows you get something else, but it's just using pathlib under the hood so it'll work. Um, if you save that to a thing, you can also then use tab completion on this object. Um, like check does that folder exist or not. You could then create that folder or, I mean, pathlib, this is just using pathlib. Pathlib is great, but we have this sort of um, shortcut syntax to get into it. Um, um, oh, and uh, the other, just a, a little great thing about pathlib is that you can do um, path joining using the, they overloaded the division operator for this. So you just do like pathlib object divided by thing and it does the join correctly depending on the underlying operating system. So it takes like all of that deep pain out of like trying to get stuff to work on Windows and Linux at the same time. Um, yeah. Um, so there are f strings from Python. We've added p strings. The, the natural question is what, what does a pf string look like? Um, and it looks like awesome is what it looks like. So you can uh, define variables um, and then uh, you can say pf and then a string and then you can treat it like an f string in the sense that you can put curly braces and it will fill in the value of those variables in the string but it's also saying this should be a pathlib path so it returns you a pathlib path of the result of the f string. Um, if you've ever done a lot of painful DevOps this, this might seem appealing in some way. Um, and the other really handy thing here is uh, that the environment variables, they're also Python objects. So you can evaluate those in F strings, which means you can evaluate those in PF strings, which means you can start chaining together environment variables and other values and other things to sort of construct paths and folders and file locations programmatically. And then once you have the pathlib thing, you can start saying, does this exist? Great, if not, touch it. Like now add it over here, and now move it over here, now do this thing. And all of these things will be um, cross-platform because uh, it's just using pathlib under the hood. So it doesn't, you know, you don't have to worry about which slash you're using or what's being escaped appropriately. Yeah, hopefully. Um, any questions on this stuff? Not too bad. Okay. Totally. Okay. So uh, we have a couple of exercises here. The first one is to uh, look up the absolute file path of every Markdown file in the tutorial repo. Just you know, you can use whatever you want. You can use Bash if you want to too. That's fine. Um, um, but PF strings and globjects are, are probably your friends here. Um, and then um, a fun one here is uh, to load up a dictionary of every Conda package you have installed in your current environment. Um, if you're not using Conda, you can just skip this one. That's okay. And if you have uh, questions, of course, just ask us and we'll all come around. Yeah, like, so uh, load it up as a Python dictionary. Well, the, the I, hint is important. Yeah, so. I would run, run that conda list JSON command and, and then I would go from there. Yeah. All right. Okay, well then I think we'll go on to the next section, which is the environment. Um, so we, um, we touched on this earlier just for a moment, but this will be a little more of what's going on and what you can do with it. Um, so the uh, environment actually lives in uh, dunderconch.env. That's the, uh, everything in, in, in conch is living in this dunderconch thing. Like that's where all of the, the various bits and pieces are. If you wanna explore and play around, it's all in there. Um, but, uh, it, the um, the dollar curly brace ellipsis is the, is a shortcut to that um, that object, so you don't have to always just type dunderconch.m to get there. Um, as we mentioned uh, earlier, 
right, you can check for uh, membership in the environment just using you know string in uh, environment, um, and you can also um, ask for help for environment variables. So there are a lot of environment, um, a lot of different uh, modes and um, kind of extras are enabled via environment variable. Um, so if you know the name of the environment variable, you see it, they, they all have default values. So if you see something that is in your environment, you're like, what is auto CD and why is it false? You can ask for help and it will tell you um, that if you turn it on, then you can just type the name of a directory and if it exists, it'll just CD into it without you having to type CD. Um, huh? Yeah, the help is a method. Yeah. Help is a method. Um, yeah, and also they, the docs will tell you if something's configurable. There are a few environment variables that you are not allowed to configure, um, so we don't let you. Um, so, uh, also something that's, that's very different from uh, Bashland here um, is that um, contra environment variables are Python objects, um, and that also means that they're typed. Um, you can we can have arguments about typing in Python, but not now, please. Um, but they do all have types, and um, sometimes those types are actually imposed uh, based on a variable name. Um, particularly, and the important ones, are anything that ends with path is going to automatically be converted into what's called an env path. Um, and if you've ever had the scenario, let's just, we can, we can do a show of hands or not, but where you've like sourced your bash RC twice, and now your path is your entire path, and then your entire path, and then something else again, <laughs> Wow, we've got four wow. questions. Oh, wow, and that you're just not even oh, that was that was a raised hand. Yeah, so we've we've all some, many of oh, us have been hand, have yeah. been in this pain place before. Yeah. That's terrible. Um, so in conch, that is not this is not a colon delimited string, and which comes back to how do you split a non white space delimited string? In, yeah. Anyway, um, you don't because it's terrible. Um, but so path is an env path, which just means that it's a it's a list of the the items on your path. But this acts like a list, which means you can do things like pop individual elements at arbitrary positions out of the path, or you can insert directories into arbitrary positions in the path, um, which uh, is great. Um, really, really great. Sorry, one question. Yeah. So if I do this uh -huh. and then exit the console, mm -hmm. that stays the same in my path? No, it's just, so just in this, if you're, if you're mutating your path in your session here, it, it will last for that session until you exit out. It won't like also, it will not like, tra like translate to a, like a separate terminal window you have open. Those are gonna be totally separate. So if you want- I think the question is if you start conch, mm -hmm. manipulate the path and then exit it, you're back into the root bash shell. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. But if you, so if you wanted to do path manipulation for all of conch, you would put that in your conch RC. But, but can I push this back up to the bash that I launched conch? No, because- okay. Why are you launching Conch from Bash? Just that is your default chat. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the real answer, but the, the reason you can't do that is uh, it, it has to do with how processes communicate. And so if you want to push environment variables into a parent process, the parent process has to source something coming from the child. And so you have to be able to source, like you would have to get Conch to dump out the environment in a way that like Bash or something could source. Well, mostly because it's obviously so much easier to manipulate your environment with Conch, but maybe that's not always how you will be, you know, if you have, let's say, some protected environment that you have to work in some other place. Right. So like to manipulate it easily. So we need an environment export? So, so we you, do that, yeah. Yeah, so you could, okay. So we'll, 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 maybe, maybe there's a solution for you. It'll be ugly, but it'll work maybe? We'll okay. find out. Yeah. Yeah. All this. All sub processes get this path. How are you supposed to start conch? Well, it. Uh, sorry. The question is: is how are you? The question is how are you supposed to start conch? So there's there's basically two ways to do it. Maybe three. I'm gonna say two. One is you open a terminal. It's running some like 1970s piece of software that doesn't work really well. And then you type conch, and then you're in something better and newer. Um, the other thing is, depending on your, um, on your operating system of choice, you can just have it start as your default shell. On Linux, this means adding it to Etsy shells and then setting it on, if you're using iTerm, you can actually just have a profile that launch it, that you can say like, I want you to launch this executable when I open a terminal or this profile. Yeah, basically any terminal emulator in, in the Unix land will let you set the, the launch program. So yeah. you just set that to conch. Or, or you change your Etsy shadow yep. if you want it to be a true login shell, which conch can be. Yeah. So. Um, right. 
So yeah, sorry, in conch, back there's to docs, there, Also, there are docs on that on the website. So if you really, there's platform specific docs. So if you want to go look up that, you can see that. Yeah. It's right in the, at the very top. Yeah. Um, so the paths are nth paths, sorry, back to environment stuff. Um, other variables are booleans, other ints. Um, whatever they are, like when you grab that environment variable in conch, it will be its true type. You know, it'll tell you that. Um, that said, if you need to, like some, some subprocess commands require, you know, these things to be fed to them as strings. Uh, and so conch does that for you um, and by detyping it. And you can also explicitly request these detyped things. Um, so you're asking, like, how do you manipulate your path and then do it? You could, I mean, like, detype it, overwrite your bash RC, exit out, and then source again. That would be moderately terrible. But it would work as long as it was an absolute path and you weren't like recursively sourcing it, it would probably work, yeah. Um, yeah, you can also do D type get path. Also do yeah. Um, yeah, and so that will, depending on what it should look like um, in the base environment, it'll do, you know, it'll give back uh, zeros or ones, not trues, and um, uh, paths get, get, get turned into colon delimited strings. Um, yeah. yeah we can move up. No. Um, there's a couple of other uh, handy methods on the environment uh, itself. Uh, in particular, um, one that's very handy is swap. Uh, and so what swap does is what swap does with, um, in general actually, but um, so you can swap in a new value and basically overwrite something and it's a context manager. So only for that block of the context manager, you can mutate certain elements of your environment, and then they will get undone as soon as you are out of the context manager. Like that. And then if we try to access this down here, it doesn't work, because some var has been removed from the environment. So this is really useful for like temporarily modifying your path or temporarily entering like a new in, like a new context that you need to run something in. Like say you want to switch between a million versions of CUDA for some reason. Like this is a way to no do that. No one would ever do that. No one would ever do that. Yeah. <laughs> Come see my tutorial tomorrow <laughs> at ABM. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, question. Maybe one question about this. Uh, uh huh. So uh, the answer is both yes and no. So we don't have a particular syntax for doing that yet because that turns out to be pretty complicated in some edge cases that we'd like to work in conch that don't work in bash, but that's a whole separate thing. But you can always run commands through env. So if you wanted to do uh, env sum var you know, uh, equals 10 uh, echo um, sum var, uh, uh, well, actually, that so that doesn't work in Bash either. I think is the thing. Yeah, that's one of those. That this is one of the things that doesn't work in Bash that we would like to have work in Conch, and so this is why this uh, um, this is why this like we really want that to work, and and that the fact that that doesn't work is why we have swap and other things. But if you wanted to set other environment variables and things like that. You Uh, in Bash, you mean? Yeah. Well, yeah, so that's a different line, right? So export will export it to everyone, and then you have to unset it, <laughs> which is annoying, uh, if you want to remove it afterwards, right? Yeah, so that's what swap gets you, yeah. Can, but, can you specify multiple variables in swap? Uh, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. So then could I for, um, have a context, like, a, like maybe like a dictionary or something? Yeah, yeah, oh, you, yeah. Could, you could star star keyword arcs. Yeah. Into yeah. that, yeah. Oh, definitely. So that would be really nice for. Kind of mm -hmm. Yep. Well. That's there. Okay, so we have a few more exercises here using uh, this stuff. Um, so these are, are things that I, I'll say like I, I both do on a regular basis. Like these are these are, these are true life examples. Um, so one is um, use get pass to uh, temporarily set your password and environment variable. So this is actually, so far as I can tell, the only way to securely type your password into a, a terminal session without it ever being saved anywhere, like including in your terminal history. 
Um, and uh, the second exercise is, this also happens to me a lot, which is like if your um, native like package manager uh, doesn't like uh, like conda curl and keeps like yelling at you because like there's some SHA mismatch, um, you just want to run an install command and just for that one install command pop like the front element of your path off. But you don't want to mutate your path forever. You just want to do that this one thing. So just you know temporarily mutate your path, run some command, and then return it. Okay. I'll give you guys a few minutes. We can circle around and answer questions. All right, so um, before we move on, any questions on the previous stuff now that breaks over? Uh, anything? All right, so the next section we're going to be talking about what we call callable aliases. So um, callable aliases are basically a way for Python functions or Python callables and subprocesses to exchange code. Um, uh, in a more integrated way than what we've seen through sort of the at operator and some of these other uh, curvy braces or curvy, I, I forget the mnemonic. This is curvy, 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 curvy captures. That's right. Um, uh, so we're going to be building up sort of data pipelines in a more uh, in, in a more integrated fashion. Um, uh, and basically, what callable aliases allow us to do is run any Python function as a subprocess command. Um, it's not any Python function, really, uh, because it requires a certain set of known signatures. But uh, assuming you adhere to that, um, and we're going to be going through what those are, uh, then you'll, you'll be able to run them. So uh, they're callables, right? So that part makes sense. Uh, they're aliases because they get stuck in what's called the aliases dictionary or the alias is mapping. So this is something that gets shoved into built-ins as well. Um, and it's just a mapping between all the possible different uh, aliases that exist. Uh, if you're familiar with other shells, you sort of know what an alias is, right? So, and if you're not, uh, you'll see it's just another way to look up commands. It's another dictionary to look up commands in. Uh, does this need to be plugged in? No. Okay. No. All right. Um, so, uh, the first function signature is just an empty fun function signature. So, and it can return either a string or an, in an integer return code, where you know zero means success and everything else means various degrees of failure. So you can do this with a lambda if you want. Um, so go ahead and type this out. So if you say aliases, you know, set item banana equals lambda with no arguments, and then banana for scale, new line, you can then run the banana command. That is it. That's the essence of callable aliases. And that, that should just work. So this is serverless for your shell. Yes, yeah, so the, as Tom Caswell, I'm going to say his name out loud. <laughs> Tom Caswell says this is lambda for your shell. Serverless for your, Server, for your shell. shell. I'm going to misquote him shamelessly. Uh, as, as well, so, um, okay. Matplotlib? Matplotlib, that's right. Yeah, as long as we're mispronouncing things, I think. Uh, okay, so you can pipe this into any other command. So the wc command counts characters and lines and words. Um, so uh, if you pass the dash w flag, that means to count the words um, based on white space. So you can say banana pipe wc dash w, and that'll tell you that the output of the banana command has three, three, uh, three words in it, right? And if if you think about what what it would take to do this in in with using subprocess with st streaming data in and out, this is doing a lot behind the cover under the covers to make all of this work for you. But it, it feels pretty natural, right? Because it's just a command, just a Python function you're running as a command in subprocess mode. Um, and of course, if you want to get rid of that aliases, a, alias because you don't like bananas, um, you can delete that alias in the same way that you would delete any other item out of a dictionary. Any questions? Yes? You can do the swap function on that too, like you were doing before with the width and everything? So swap is for environments, and a, a, aliases is a totally different mapping. Okay. Yeah. Uh, having a swap is not a bad idea, though. Please open an issue. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you know there's there's a live? banana command on Ubuntu? I did not know that there was a banana command what on Ubuntu. What does Emboss do? I don't know. 
Do, what are you doing? <laughs> Where do, where do what? Yeah, yeah, so aliases live in their own dictionary that gets shoved, or a, unfortunately aliased, uh, into built-ins. So okay. we're not really, in this tutorial, talking about how Conch does all these tying of things together under the covers. But in built-ins, there's an aliases dictionary that you can access at any time. Yeah, yeah, and that allows it to persist. So you can modify aliases or add these commands in your conchar C, and then they all live indefinitely. OK. Um, uh, the next is that you can take a single argument, which is uh, the command line arguments. So like sys.argv, if you're familiar with that. Um, and it's ba it comes in as a list of strings. So if you provide one argument, uh, that's called, it, it, it's typically called args, then you can take command line parameters. So here's an apple function which takes, uh, takes an args, it'll look at it and it'll say, is my args list of length one? Um, and uh, do one thing and if, and, and succeed, return zero, right? Because you can return the return code from these functions. And if not, um, it'll re or, and otherwise it'll return one. So, um, yep. And then, <laughs> uh, uh, and just showing off another bit of syntax. If you use this with the at Python mode operator, you can. You don't even need to stick this in aliases. You can just call it directly because it's a Python object. So if you put the command, the function, uh, at parentheses function as the first argument, um, and then pass in a some command line arguments after that, it'll read it in. <coughs> Any questions on how this works? Any callable will work. Any callable will work. So callable classes are? Callable classes are, are yes. Okay. Yes, go callable classes. Yeah, this is not limited to uh, functions and, and, uh, and lambdas and things. OK. Uh, yeah. And of course, there's a formatting bug, but that's whatever. You, yeah. I actually have a question. Sure. Um, so, if you're treating aliases that do different things, such as lambda or functions, what is it? So, would you rather do a function, create a function in your environment and have it be stored in your built in rather than doing like an alias function like you would do with bash? Uh, yeah, so the question is would you just want this to live in your, con your conch execution context, the Python execution context, or would you want this to live in aliases specifically like you might do in bash? Um, oftentimes, you just you stick them into the aliases dictionary like you do in bash because it's easier to call them, it's simpler to call them. It's kind of, that's kind of the where, what that's there for and where it lives. Um, if for some reason you don't want to have it, uh, there and you just wanted to have in, have it in your execution context. That's fine. That's fine too. Yeah. All right. Okay. So let's uh, move on. So the in the next case, you can provide in se sequential order any of standard in, standard out, and standard error. Um, and these are keyword arguments, and they default to none. Right, you may not have one of those streams, although usually you have standard in. Um, so those come uh, immediately following the arguments parameter. So here we've got a grape function, uh, or an underscore grape function. This is actually the, the most common pattern, is you have, pattern, sorry, is you have the function uh, name preceded by an underscore, um, and then you put that into uh, the aliases dictionary without the underscore. Um, and basically what these do is these give you file-like handles for standard in, standard out, and standard error. So if these are present, you can access them and do whatever you would do normally uh, with those, those handles. So um, we do some contact switching under the covers too. So like if you just write to sys.standard in or sys.standard error, et cetera, that, that works as well. But um, it's usually better and, and uh, to write directly to those file handles. So here, um, if you wanted to implement something that's streaming, but not asynchronous, um, you would do for line in standard in, you'd be reading lines from standard in, and then we'd be writing them out, um, right back out to standard out, lowering them as we go. 
Okay. Yep. The underscore pattern is there because when you source, uh, you don't get under you don't get the underscore variables in your execution context. Those don't get brought in automatically. So uh, it's a way of hiding things from your execution context if you don't want to pollute the namespace that you're just working in all the time. Yeah. Okay, so usage, here we go. So this takes a standard in and kind of needs it because we didn't check if it was none here. So if we spell echo wrath um, with, uh, uh, and then pipe that to our grape command, uh, it will lowercase that and write it back out. Does this make sense to everybody? All right, so the, the, the standard in, the output of echo wrath becomes the standard in of the grape function, which then operates and then writes back out to what is our, our terminal's standard out. Because it, that, the grape is being called last in the pipeline. Okay. Um, you can use any of these, but if, if, if you want to use standard error, you have to use standard in and standard out. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, okay. Oops. Yeah. So uh, next up is you can also get a handle or a, a, a reference to the command specification. So this is a, a specific object that the command pipeline also has access to. It's, it's basically how conch thinks you should be running the command. It's how the command pipeline got set up for that particular subcommand. Um, so this is a rich Python object. You can go look at the API if you want to. But it, it effectively contains all the metadata about how you should be running that command. Um, including what goes in and what goes out. So that'll come in after the standard in, standard out, and standard error. Um, and you can do kind of like funny things here. So one of the things you can do is you can, you can use this for is you can check whether the uh, command is meant to be in a captured subprocess. So that we, we talked about that before. So you can check to see like, am I running this in a captured subprocess or not? So this is particularly useful if you want to know if you're connected to a live terminal or not, um, or if you want to like, this is actually used in the which command pretty frequently, um, where you don't want to append a new line if you're capturing it. If you're just printing it out to the screen, you want the new line to be there because you want everything to look nice, but otherwise, um, you don't want the new line to be there. So, um, and you can import part of conch to, to do this check for you if, it, uh, uh, if that makes it easier. And here's just our QE. And this will have output that looks sort of like this. So if we just run the Kiwi command, uh, yep. and then end equals end, but you didn't close the quote, yep. And then, yeah, so if you just run the Kiwi command on its own in an un uncaptured way, it will produce the new line and the extra text. And if you capture the Kiwi command, then it doesn't actually have the new line in it. Okay? Any, any questions on this or use cases? Or anything? Yeah. All right, so let's, uh, let's move on. Um, so the last form of these functions is uh, it, you can get back uh, the stack frame of the call site of the alias. So if you need to know the locals and global variables where the subprocess command was being called from, you get back the, the stack for that. If you don't understand what this means, like don't worry about it, you definitely don't need it. But if you do, this is like a ridiculous tool. Um, so please stack responsibly. Um, but uh, it, it, it is something that's like, you know, we, we don't need to necessarily dive into this, but it is occasionally useful to know what your, what the variables are around where you're being, where the, the subprocess is being called. Um, and conch does that tying in for you automatically. <coughs> Any questions on this? I know this is, this one in particular is a little wacky. Okay, 
So we've got some more exercises. Um, they're all related, uh, which is nice. Uh, so the first exercise is to write a callable alias, which just pulls down the contents of Frankenstein and uh, writes them out to the screen. So if you get, look at that link, it's basically the Project Gutenberg link. Um, and so you can just copy that and, and provide an alias that prints out Frankenstein to the screen, grabbed from the internet. Or you can grab it and then print it out however you want. Um, uh, the next is to write an alias that calls upper on the standard input and returns that as output. Uh, the next one is to write an alias that returns all of the unique w sorted words coming from standard in. Um, the next one after that is to write an alias that counts the number of white space separated tokens read from standard in. And then finally, the combine all of those into to a single command pipeline that executes. And we will definitely walk around and help, or you can look at the, the details. Um, each of these is, can, is basically a one-liner, so don't overthink it. But it's OK to overthink it if it gets the job done. I think that's fully qualified. So for the first one, if you uh, you don't need to use Python necessarily um, to to do this so much, you can just set set an alias to Frankenstein that is a, a lambda that calls curl or wget or whatever on that URL, and that will grab that URL that we listed just straight away. So. If you're using requests or something, you, you can definitely do that. That's totally fine, but you don't need to. So you can use a command here. Um, yeah. So if you're getting stuck on that, that's, that's there. And then, yep, yeah, I'm sorry. All right, I, I'll come over. So, or, but we should, uh, should we do the second one too? Yeah. So for the second one, if you want an upper, uh, all you have to do is take both args and standard in, just read everything from standard in, and then call, which is a string, and then return uh, the upper of that string. You could also do it in this streaming version where you have lines that you're reading from and then uh, writing them back out to standard out. It's a little more complicated. You don't really need to do that. So for the third example, um, or the third exercise here, we do something pretty similar where, um, to the other, where we want a count of words. Um, so the way that you do this is you read from standard in, um, and then you split those, split based on the white space, right? We're all pretty familiar with that. Um, if you want the unique, right? So that'll give you this big word list in order. If you want to unique that, you call set around it to get the unique words. And then if you want them sorted, you call sorted around that. And then you join based on new lines uh, so that you output a string again. And that's the, uh, that's the thing that you return. Kind of a lot of parentheses, but it gets the job done in one line. You could do it in more lines if you wanted to clean it up like we did in some of the other examples, but there's no need here. Do we have the, we don't have these loaded in. Oh, you do, okay. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Oh, nope. Okay. <laughs> it's probably in the, yeah. So, for example, if you ran this, it's not perfect, right, because this is text processing, but <laughs> um, th there it is. Um, then for the fourth example or fourth exercise, if you wanted to count the length of that thing coming in, you'd have to basically do the same thing, right? So here you'd you'd read it in, you'd split based on white space again, oops, and then instead of 
calling set or something else, you call length, uh, which returns an integer. You don't want that integer to be the return code, so you have to convert it to a string, add a new line, and, uh, and then you go from there. Um, so that's how you do, or you can do wc.l because reasons. Um, you could also do that. That'd be a better example here. Um, do that in the alias? You could do that in the alias, yeah. You could run. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the simplest form of the alias, really. And then pull down Frankenstein. Is Oh, I think we just did. <laughs> we really love this Frankenstein thing. <laughs> what did you do? Thank you, Mike McCarty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let's do it the. Yeah, do it the right way. Um, what was it? Upper. I'll let you do this. And then. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you forgot the thing. We'll uh, we'll debug that later. Uh, oops, sorry. You want the? Yeah, it's just words and then count. The real count. And then the point here is that you can merge all of these together in a single command pipeline uh, that executes. So, OK, any, uh, any questions on this? All right, so let's, uh, let's if there's no questions on how this works or, or what it uses, we'll move on. Not a break, because we're doing breaks differently. Um, and our next topic will be events, which, uh, so switch with Gil. Okay, so um, uh, an event is, um, it's hard to actually describe an event, I discovered this. Um, <laughs> but um, it's, it's, a, it's a trigger that you can fire. And then um, if uh, you have something that's set up to listen to that firing, which we would call a handler, it will then execute that thing. That is a horrible, vague description, um, but is, uh, I think will be a little clear when we actually go through an example. I'll just say, the events uh, system in Kant was written by one of our uh, contributors, Jamie Bliss, and is just an incredible piece of work, and I can say that because I had nothing to do with it. Um, it's really incredibly powerful um, and lets you do a lot of really interesting things if you want to, like, introspect your code or have all sorts of things happen in response to all kinds of events. You can really start to, um, do some very uh, interesting, clever, and powerful things here. Um, right, so I said this. Um, a, a handler is just a function that is called when an event is fired. So something says event, this kind of event fires, any handler that is attached to that event will then be run. And you can have as many handlers as you want on a given event. So several functions can be executed in response to something just happening somewhere. Um, okay. So one of the events, um, all of these live in just the events uh, kind of built in at the base, so you can say events. Um, one of the common ones, there's several that are built in to conch. Later we can look at like defining your own, but there are many that are built in. Uh, the first is um, on uh, change year, uh, which fires, if you can imagine, uh, whenever you change directory. Um, um, so this event already exists. So what we want to do is just create a handler that will execute in response to that event being fired. Um, so the way that you do that is with this decorator syntax. So you just say at events and the name of the event. Um, and in particular, this event uh, hands off two um, variables to whatever function is, is being called as handler. We'll show you how to sort of inspect that later. Um, they're called older and newder, uh, or old deer and new deer, depending on your preferred pronunciation of <laughs> words that aren't words. 
Um, and then in this case, just for a kind of a, a simple example, I'm just printing out a message that says, hey, we just changed from this directory to that directory. Um, so now you can just move around in your terminal, like do a cd dot dot, and it'll tell you this thing. And you could go back into the like directory you were just in. Um, of course, now uh, your, your terminal is, is probably a little overly verbose, and you don't want this to happen all the time. Um, so um, you can always remove handlers too, because maybe you've made a mistake and it's saying way more than you meant it to say, and you would just like to have your terminal back. Um, so the simplest way is just there's a set of handlers on each event, and you can just pop them off. So in this case, events on change dear um, dot pop, and then you should see the thing come up, and then you can just test to make sure that your terminal has recovered by you know going somewhere else and confirming that in fact there is uh, no longer something being printed every time. Um, so that was just a quick example to show you sort of what an event will do. We can now we'll sort of just dive in a little deeper um, into what's happening and like what all you can do and how you can hook into things. Um, so as we showed, you register a handler by just using the name of the event as a decorator. Um, those um, input arguments, uh, the keyword arguments that are there, are being um, supplied by the event itself. Um, there are two ways to uh, kind of figure out what an event provides. Um, you can just um, do help and then event dot name event. Um, currently in Conch, that has the unfortunate side effect of also printing out a bunch of like meta class stuff that you maybe don't care about at the moment. Um, if you just want the simple succinct definition, the better thing is just to look at the dunder doc of the event you want. So in this case, you can see that um, it is uh, specifying the types of the two arguments that will be provided. Right there, yeah. Um, and it's returning none. So you sort of have this um, like type hint signature that uh, describes what arguments will be provided, their types, and then what will come out of the event, if anything. Is there any yes. way to get a list of events available? Yes, there, is a, there, there are two ways to get a list of events that are available. Um, currently, the tab completion on that events shortcut is a little bit borked, which we're going to fix like in a couple of days. But if you go to uh, dunder conch dot built ins, built ins dot events, and then hit dot tab, all of those. Um, and the other way uh, is if you go to the docs, there's a, you know, uh, xon.sh slash events, I think it is .html. But on the website, there's a list of all of them, what they do when they fire. Um, um, yeah. Um, also, I should say, um, if you want to register a handler for an event, but you don't actually care, I mean, it's going to provide those arguments no matter what you do. Um, like, it, it, that's what the event does to the handler. You can choose not to use them, but you do need to say, like, you need to give it, like, a star star quargs or something to at least capture them, or it will throw an error because you're going to pass arguments to a function that doesn't know how to accept them. So it's just, you know, you can make these future basically um, future-proof just so long as you always pass it star star quargs, and then you don't have to worry about something firing uh, or, like, yeah, passing unknown arguments to your handler. Um, so events get fired when uh, we tell them to fire or when you tell them to fire uh, is, is effectively the short answer to how these things get set off. Um, um, but so we'll walk through an example of setting up our own event and telling it to fire, just to give you a notion of, of kind of what this all looks like and how you would put all of this together. Okay, so first um, we need to create an event. Um, and uh, the way you create an event is actually by writing a doc string for it. It's sort of like the ultimate self-documenting code. Like it's impossible to create an event in Conch without it having documentation because that's the only way to create it. Um, it's kind of amazing. <laughs> Um, so uh, we're going to create an event that just raises an alarm if it's called, that just, you know, that it's unhappy. Um, so the, the way you do this is you say events.doc, right? And then the first argument you give it is the title, is the name of the event, uh, which in this case is never run this. 
um, and then you give it a doc string, which should be um, uh, the, uh, the signatures. In this case, this event takes no arguments and returns none. So it's just a, it's a simpler um, thing. So it would just be events not, never run this, uh, parens, arrow, none. And then you can, um, on uh, the next line, you can kind of provide a description of, of what you know, you're expecting it to do. Um, that's more for other users or other people. So if you were writing a plugin and you wanted to have some events, you would kind of try to put your explanations in here so people understand how they can use the events you provided um, to full effect. Okay, so now what we're going to do is um, the way you would use this event is you would, um, it's an event that you basically want to never be fired. So you, you, you would put it in a function that for some reason you have, like really should never be run. But you're, you know, you, you, you want to recognize that it may exist. And so you put this event in there to kind of alert you that this thing is happening. So uh, if you wrote a function that deleted everything on your computer, I don't know why, but let's just say you did. <clears throat> um, then what you would do in, let's say, the first line of that function or somewhere along is that you would just say events dot and then never run this, which we've defined in that um, uh, previous doc string thing, and then dot fire. And then what happens is that whenever that function is called and it gets to that line, the event uh, management system will basically fire that event. So we can go ahead actually and run delete my computer, and uh, nothing happens. So it, in fact, actually, um, something does happen, right? The event fired, but we have nothing listening to the event, so you don't get anything out of it, right? So then the final step is to set up a handler to add it. So we, we create the event, we tell the event to fire, and then we have something that listens for the event firing that then reacts to it, right? So there's these three separate, there's these three separate components. Um, and given the fact that this is a, uh, like, an event that's supposed to fire when somebody has done something horrible to you, uh, you can make it a suitably chastening message. Um, um, and as always, um, like you have access to the full, you know, uh, contra spectrum here. So if you want, like in this case, it, like the who am I is a nice thing. You can figure out exactly which user is responsible for doing this horrible thing to you. Um, That's a good tip, yeah, perfect. Um, so then if you run delete my computer again, then the event fires, and now you have, you know, you know that it was Scopatz that deleted your computer. I'm sorry. Can't take him anywhere. Sorry. Okay, so um, are there any initial questions? Otherwise, there's some exercises here that should help kind of like cement the general um, pattern in place. But we're happy to take questions first. OK, great. Um, so the, these sort of build on one another, so I'll like reveal them as we go. Um, but the first is just to create a handler for the event that is called on nvar change. Um, this is a built-in uh, event. You don't need to create the event. You just want a handler for the event. And you want to have it print out the um, old value and then the new value and of course the name of the environment of the environment variable that's just changed. Um, so you should probably check on the doc, the dunder doc of the event to figure out what those variables are called. Otherwise it's going to be hard to refer to them. And Anthony and I can sort of wander and help. So as Gil showed up here, um, if you just write a simple if condition to check if the name, which comes in as a string, is like the doc string says, is in uh, is either PWD or old PW, PWD, and then only print if it's not. We can um, we can check to make sure that it works normally for most environment variables. But if we change directory, it um, it it no longer gets called. So, <coughs> and then I think we're. I need a little low on time, so maybe we'll skip this uh, this particular uh, exercise. But you can go. Feel free to do it at home and, and email us too.
Uh, <laughs> do you want to just show it or? Okay. So one of the really um, handy ones for doing some control flow, we don't we won't take time to actually you know uh, do it right now, but there's on post command, which um, has a, a bunch of um, of those uh, items that you get in the um, command pipeline object, uh, including like timestamps, the name of the command that was run, and other stuff. So in this case, this is all it takes basically to set up like a, a power line style, like the timestamps of the previous command, and just throw it onto your write prompt over on the side. It's really just like this three line event handler thing that you can use, and then you kind of set up this interactive thing to track. Um, you can also get like return codes and start coloring things differently. I mean, it gets really easy to build stuff up that, you know, to get sort of the responsive prompt that you want. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to talk about macros. Um, so, Macros are syntax that replace a small amount of code with some with one of a few things. So either uh, another expression or a syntax tree or just a string, rather than being evaluated normally. Um, so basically, what happens in Conch is that the the parser gets paused, um, and then we skip the normal parsing. Um, we gather up whatever macro inputs are going to be. Uh, are, are handed off. We'll get to what those are in a moment. Uh, we evaluate the macro with however we're told to evaluate it. Um, and then we resume normal parsing and, and execution. Um, so Concha's macro system is more like Rust's than uh, other macro systems you might be familiar with. So who here like, knows Rust even a, 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 little, a little? So this gets used all the time in Rust. So if you're from, if you know that, it'll look familiar. If not, hopefully it won't be uh, too much of a learning curve here. Um, uh, but basically, the point of this is that um, you're already familiar with macros, nominally. Jupyter magics are just a macroing system, effectively. They, they pause normal execution and do something else. Um, uh, so in, like in Rust, the conch macros use the special exclamation point syntax. Um, and they're three types of macros that we have. Um, so one are subprocess macros, which we'll go over first. The next are function macros, uh, which we'll follow after. And then third is context macros. So we'll see what all of these look like in, in a moment here. So let's start with subprocess macros. So basically, if you put an exclamation point anywhere, a lone exclamation point anywhere in your command pipeline, anything after that will just be interpreted as a single string argument to the rest of the command. Um, so if you say echo, exclamation point, I'm Mr. Meeseeks, for example, then that entire thing is just a single string uh, after the exclamation point. It's stripped, uh, we'll get, but um, to show some counter examples, if you just echo X, Y, Z, right? Echo doesn't really care about the white space. Um, so normally you'd have to pass this in as a string, um, which is two characters. But if you use a macro, you only have to use one. It's echo, exclamation point, x, y, z, and that whole thing. It's equivalent to having put that everything in a string. OK. Now this is sort of a contrived example. Um, oh, but before we get into that, um, and it's important to remember that macros pause all syntax, right? Uh, before, until you escape the subprocess command. So environment variables uh, will all just be listed as, their, as the string you typed in, not anything else. Because um, we're not parsing that as an environment lookup anymore. Um, so if you, can, if, if you want a more like, extended example, you can say you can have an environment lookup on both sides, and you'll see the first one is, uh, is the value, and the second one is actually just the string that you typed in. Um, OK. Um, so this is really useful when you want to pass in a lot of string, like a very large string to a command. Um, so for example, time it. Time it's like a classic case for this, right? So if you do time it and then some Python code, uh, time it is a built-in alias in conch, so you don't need to worry about implementing it. Um, it's there. Um, all of that is a, is a Python st string that follows, or a conch string that follows. Um, 
Uh, or similarly, if you wanted to do some bash code, right? Normally, you'd have to put that bash code in a string um, and then execute it. But with the subprocess macro, you can just uh, type in the exclamation point, and it's uh, it's done. Um, or you can do this with Python. Basically, any of the things that you want to pass into dash c to, um, it'll work. Okay. I think, uh, what did you? Miss friends. Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, any questions on the subprocess macros? They're pretty simple. That's why we did them first. Uh, the, okay. So let's move on to the function macros. So these get a little more fun. Um, so, Macros don't require a special function definition. They only require a special function call. They modify how the function is called. Um, and uh, it's just normal Python callables. What you do to call something as a macro is you stick an exclamation point between the name and the first, the open parentheses. Um, and macro arguments are split on commas like normal functions. So here's a few simple examples. Uh, so if we had an f function, if we wanted to call it as a macro with no arguments, we would say f exclamation point parentheses. If you're used Rust, this should look pretty familiar. Um, uh, if you want to call it with a single argument, uh, you would say, you would do sort of the normal Python single argument uh, methods, or you can call it with multiple arguments splitting on those top level commas. Um, okay. Um, how the function is defined uh, determines what happens, uh, or specifically how the function annotations, what the function annotations look like, determine what actually happens in the macro uh, when you do a macro call. Um, and that's matched up with each individual parameter. Uh, so here's an example. So say you have an identity function that has its annotation for its x parameter set to string that x that comes in uh, when it's a macro call will always be a string, um, even if what's, no what's normally put into that is not a string. So here's a, here's a comparison between the, the two different versions. So in the top, we have the identity function. We call it with a string, we get a string back. But on the bottom, when we call it with um, the identity with a string, but as a macro call, we get a, the, the wrapper string effectively, right, returned. Um, similarly for ints, in a normal Python call, you'd get an int back in the identity, you always get, uh, the, or in the macro call, you always get the string, and same thing with the, the, the others, right? You, you get the string form of the argument rather than the, um, rather than the, the actual object itself. Um, each argument is stripped. Uh, this is basically done for consistency uh, so that things like uh, 42 and 42 don't end up being different. They're not really meant to be different. So um, in this string one, uh, they end up being the same. You, feel free to like raise any questions or deep concerns or anything as we're going. Yeah, Tom. Why? We'll, we'll, we're getting to why in in context macros, which you'll see some cool things. Um, but it's the, same, it's, it's the same underlying infrastructure for functions. Okay. Uh, yeah, wow, so consistent. Um, uh, uh, okay, so here's some like funny examples uh, that are really pretty bad. Um, so if you macro call like import OS, obviously this is not valid Python syntax, but in any way, shape, or form, but you can get that code back. Um, you could embed some C++, uh, because I don't know why. Um, I forget C++. That, so hard. Wow, if only I could forget C++. Um, uh, you don't have to type so you don't that. Have to quote that in the... No, you don't have to quote that. It's not, it's a way of like circumventing that quoting. Yeah, um, in this particular example. But there's more things that you can do than just strings. We just showed the strings here. Um, so if you said, 
Uh, you wanted this to be an AST. There's, there's kind of flag codes for this if you want to annotate it in different ways. You can get back the AST of what you put in if it's Python or conch code. So you can get that tree object back out, which is uh, pretty, pretty nice and useful if you're doing a lot of like uh, a tree rewriting. Um, you can get a code object out if you want to want to put in uh, exec or eval or something, or if you put in the C flag, or, or sorry, if you put in compile. Um, there's six of these, so here are the first three. The others are eval, so that would just eval the argument as normal, so that means that you basically could only put in Python expressions. Um, if you wanted to put in exec, you could put in uh, basically anything that you wanted, uh, or you could say T and, and get the type back. Um, so and, and in theory, this could be extended if there are other things out there that people would want to see done, uh, but this is kind of, this is what's available right now. Um, any questions on this stuff? Okay. Um, okay, so here's an example of some annotations. Uh, a simple function, so we're annotating with uh, this, the first argument by default, since it's got no annotation, will just come back as a string. The second one will be an AST object, and the third one will be a code object, because we're passing in compile, the built-in compile function, um, if we do a macro call, so. Yep, see a lot of pensive people. Heads exploding. Um, okay. Uh, of this one, yeah. So just call it with anything um, or any Python thing. Exclamation point. Yep. Uh, I don't know, like three plus five, I guess. I don't. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think you have to do a new line after the three plus five, right? Or after the OS. I think it's after the OS because you did a statement. No, no, no. Like a literal new line. <laughs> I'll do it. It's too... Uh, String. Interesting. Uh, I thought there was an example here. All right. Well, this is not working right now. I don't know what the. This should. No further code. Okay. Well, it's not. It's failing to compile one of these things. So um, let's maybe just do this. Yeah, I don't know what's, uh, what the problem is. I'm sorry. We'll have to figure it out afterwards. Yeah. So um, we have a parser error. All right. Um, OK, sorry about that. Uh, so the next, the, the last bit of macros that we'll get to are context macros. So these use the exclamation point right after the with uh, word. So you can use with exclamation point. Um, and then everything after the colon will be captured uh, uh, like it was in a normal uh, with statement. So this provides both named blocks and anonymous blocks. Um, so if you say, this isn't going to work because there's no x to enter, but if you say with x equals 10 print y, this would come uh, come back as a, as a string. Um, and what this can be thought of really is as doing the follow. So you can think of this as saying uh, whatever your context is, x dot macro block equals the string of the code in the block d indented, um, and then assigning the locals and globals to, to, vary, to attributes of that as well, and then passing for the actual block. Um, so it's a bit of code rewriting. Macro block is de-indented, um, and uh, these attributes are set before the enter method is called. Um, 
but they're not cleaned up on the exit method, so you can do that if you want to, uh, but they live around. They stay around and live if you, if you need them. Um, like with functions, by default, the contents of the block are returned as a string. Um, however, they don't need to be. They could be any of the other special annotations that we saw before. Um, and that just lives as the, this conch block uh, attribute on the context manager. So that's how it knows what to look up, what type to convert it to. Um, so here's an example. Um, and, and this is, gets to the use case a bit. So we can write a simple XML block. So if we say, we're just going to be pretty explicit. You don't need the comments, obviously. Um, if, so we say it's going to come back as a string. We write an enter method that takes the contents of the block as a string and will parse them into an element tree, an XML element tree, and return that um, as, the, uh, as the object in the context manager. Um, then when it exits, we're just going to clean up those things, the things that we, we had before. Yeah, I think you need the star or whatever. Macro locals, yeah. Okay, and then you can use this. Oh, it's cutting it off a bit, but um, uh, by saying with exclamation point, XML block a new object as tree colon, oh, and then everything. Um, you can just do a short one. So just do like you could even just do yeah you. Uh, and then just close out the note, I think. <laughs> um, and now if we, in, we can inspect the tree object, tree is an instance of, so I think, what is it? If you do tree.tag, um, that gets the note. So it parses that XML. So this lets you write documents in other languages, write in conch, and then do whatever you want with them. Um, which is somewhat insane, but actually kind of useful occasionally. Um, and you saw like writing that context mac macro object, uh, that class was actually pretty simple. Um, it didn't take a lot of lines of code to do that. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's kind of the scenario there. Um, and hopefully that answers at least partially the use case question. Okay, so we have a few exercises. Um, uh, the first is to use a subprocess macro. So just run time it um, on uh, the string and uh, formatting a string. Um, the second is to call the import module as a macro. Um, so you don't have to use quotes. And the third is to run a, a write a JSON block context manager. Get into our exam, yeah. and then we need to get into our like longer thing. I think. Yeah. Any questions on any of these, or if there are questions, um, format equals forty-two. And you see, like, what this really prevents uh, once the time it completes is you having to run it with an extra set of quotes, right? Because time it expects just a single argument that takes. Um, so this is the same, this is fundamentally the same, but you just, you don't have to type that extra set of quotes, so. Okay. Oops. Uh, all right, so you want to move on to the next? Sure. Uh, and then, yeah, for the standard library uh, import lib, um, so this is just showing you can, you actually, you can just use existing functions, but call them using the macro syntax. And so in this case, you get back the, um, Import yep. lib, sorry. Yeah. Dot import module. So if we do sys, uh, right, because the first argument is a string, you can just get that. So it'll it'll take it'll turn whatever you type at into a string. Okay. And then 
Uh, the third one is this JSON block, so this should be very familiar to the XML one, where um, now we just have, or now we have uh, JSON. We don't need the, the macro block part because that's optional, um, but we, uh, oops, on enter, um, we'll assume that the code that comes in is uh, part of, uh, is valid JSON. So we'll return uh, JSON dot loads of self dot macro block. Um, and then on exit, uh, we'll, do this, we'll do the same delete portion just to clean up after ourselves as well. Um, and so a use case for this is just with uh, JSON block as, let's call it x, um, and we can write like, uh, hello, just some random JSON. And now x is a dictionary that was parsed from that JSON. Pretty, pretty simple, uh, silly example, because JSON and, and Python are so similar here, but uh, you know, it's, it's a one way to do things, so. Any questions on these exercises? Yeah. So where does this JSON block object end up in this case? What do you mean? So x ended up as the return value of enter. Yes. So where did the JSON block instance? It's gone. Okay, so like the, so the cleanup is a little, I guess you keep showing the cleanup, implying these things are leaking. Well, so the macro block and macro globals and macro locals, yeah. So, so th this would leak I get, in the case where you instead returned self from the okay. from the from the enter method. Okay. Right. But it's not like conscious of keeping a cache. Of no, no, it's not. It's not keeping a cache. It, it, it would only leak if you. So like, so the the place where it would leak potentially, where you wouldn't want it to necessarily, is like if you wanted to have the same. Th instance of JSON block be re-entrant, like mm -hmm. that's what this makes us. So you could like have one instance of JSON block and then just re-enter it every time uh, and always get the tree back. Um, uh, or if you returned self and we're doing something else with it later, right? So yeah, that, that's where the references get yeah. added. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Sort of? Um, Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the, the thing is, like, if you returned, uh, so if you said, like, uh, self dot, um, like, maybe you wanted, like, like, maybe you wanted to keep the J object around, so you did, like, JSON dot, or you wanted to keep the tree, um, so you do JSON dot loads of, self dot macro block and then um, and then you'd return self uh, you know you might not want to keep the globals you might want to keep the macro block itself around but you might not want to keep the all the locals and, and globals here um, and so uh, just using this so now x is the JSON block and then x dot uh, tree oops, is the uh, is the actual tr version, but you still have access to the string of what the macro block was. Yeah. They are the uh, they they're the the name they're the local and global <laughs> uh, dictionaries, like as if you had called locals and globals the Python built-ins, where the where the macro block was called or the context macro was was written. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK. Yeah. Any other questions on this? So, uh, so you're given the use case of you know, writing a different language. What are the use cases of typically being used for macros? Yeah, so the most common use case is really something like time at, right? It's really those. Um, there's a couple of cases where that I've that we've used these things where like if you wanted to write some bash and you really needed it to be bash in a local context, then you would then you write like a little bash thing. Um, 
There's been some other use cases where we take input or configuration files in as these macro blocks. Um, uh, but otherwise, yeah, it's, th that's kind of the use cases. So. Uh, Import, sorry, saying. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that that was that's just a toy. Uh, that's kind of a toy example to show. Um, right, this comes from the standard library, and the st standard library didn't uh, doesn't know anything about Concha's macro system, so it didn't annotate these functions in any particular way. And this is just showing that you that you can use you can use the macros on those functions if, you, if those functions happen to take string arguments. Okay, so it's, more demonstrating it's, it's demonstrating, yeah. The, the function macro stuff just ended up having to, it kind of had to be there for the context ma macro stuff. Um, that infrastructure all had to be the same. So it's there and available in the language if you want it. But um, I wouldn't say there's like a killer feature for it unless you're coming from Rust, or you, or you really like doing a lot of AST syntax, AST tree like rewriting and stuff. Um, in which case, this makes it easy for you to provide those rewriters or pattern matchers um, inside of Conch. But there aren't that that intersection is basically me. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, okay. Cool. Good question. Great question. Uh, let's, we should maybe skip this. Well, except we don't know if we can. Yeah, well, I can try to upload this stuff real quick. Okay. Um, so this is gonna be uh, interesting as we discover if this is even possible anymore. Um, but there, uh, there is an example here, which is that we were uh, working in a, in a lab that had a bunch of MRIs of mouse lemurs. Um, that's a mouse lemur. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we had all these MRI data, um, but uh, it was set up on a web server by a postdoc who disappeared last week. Um, and we have some other bad news, uh, which is that he used Bash to handle all the data collection. Uh, he didn't know how to make sure that different data sets were saved to separate directories, so he just added a random four-digit number to the end of all of these um, NII uh, MRI image data files. Um, and he also neglected to do this with the JSON metadata that was included with it, so that's all been overwritten and lost. Um, and then he ran remove with an overly permissive glob, uh, deleted all of them, and uh, the files are kind of big in the postdocs web servers at his house. We don't want to have to download all of them. Um, that being said, uh, the web server at the house, which is on my laptop, is completely inaccessible to everyone on this network, it turns out, which makes this a little trickier. Um, um, the data is now on uh, GitHub at, uh, in this repo called <laughs> MRI data, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, it, this may not be possible, so we'll find out. It's gonna be a learning adventure for all of us. Um, we do know a couple of things about the data. So this is sort of our exploratory thing. They all do follow this naming convention uh, so you just have like sub dash two digit number underscore four digit number dot NII. Um, the files are large, but the first 348 bytes uh, of each file is a header. So you can nominally just pull down the header. Um, we're pretty sure there are 19 mouse lemur scans. Um, and uh, the cervical spine study going on in the lab next door, which is mixed in with all of this data, only has six subjects. Um, and nominally, this is how you would use curl to only pull down the first 348 bytes of a file if there were a functioning web server available. Um, we're going to discover together if you can do this from like the raw link on a GitHub repo, but we're not sure. Um, so having said that, if you would like to even try this, and we welcome your uh, support and efforts, um, you can install uh, NIBabel, uh, N-I-B-A-B-E-L, on Condaforge, which is a, a nice package for loading in this MRI data. Um, or it's on PIP, right, too? I don't know. Oh, you don't know. Okay, yeah. I don't even look on PIP anymore. Yeah. Um, uh, and then um, we are all going to 
try together to see if we can um, just download the headers of each of these files to sort of determine which of them are the ones we want so we don't just download everything, which is never usually the right answer to these sorts of questions. Maybe we should see if we can curl one of them right now. Yeah, let's try it. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so what it's curl dash r, and then what, oh, I should have kept that. And then what's the GitHub URL? Well, the GitHub API should be, this feels way too much like real science right now. So it would be uh, github.com, g 4 MRI data, sorry, blob master, raw equals true. That didn't work. No, that, I thought there was like a real, like, isn't there like a raw user data kind of thing? Where does that live at? I think usually it's there unless the file is too big. Oh, okay. This is why you don't store, you know, big data on GitHub this way. So it's a really bad pattern. Let's try this one. Received. Uh, no such key. Oh, maybe that one's not up yet. It's another one of these file names that's definitely up. Woohoo, that worked. Uh, <laughs> okay, time to rewrite the slides. <laughs> Which you'll be able to reload and copy from. <laughs> yeah. What's that DigitalOcean droplet? Uh, here, I'll, I'll put it in this chat. Sorry about this, everyone. <laughs> You're getting a split screen by sharing your screen. Yes. And then goes. Yeah, no, the, the network's all kinds of fun today. <laughs> Wait, what? Oh, God, Google. Oh, I hate Google. <laughs> <laughs> don't help me, Google. I don't want your help. Your help is terrible and poison. It's not help, it's spying. Just <laughs> Stop spying on everything we do. They're watching us right now. That's true. It really is true. But we, we asked them to this time. Shh. Can you curl down a file list from there? Does that work? No. I don't, well, I don't know. How do, what was the command for doing that? I don't know. All right, I think. Oh, it should just be this. Okay, oh. this will work. <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah. That, 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 the information's in there. Okay, so. You have an XML block, right? Yeah, so, you <laughs> so, so you've got an XML block. <laughs> All right. Um, we are happy to answer questions along the way. This should actually work, though, which is kind of amazing. Um, so we have, uh, the, the postdoc is better than we thought he was, um, and has uploaded the files to this uh, digital ocean droplet. Uh, that I've just added to this slide. Um, so if you reload the slide deck, you should be able oh, to. Oh, I haven't, I haven't pushed it up yet. Oh, okay. I'm well. sorry. I can't, I can't push anything right now because I haven't set up the SSH thing and it wasn't working. Sorry. Um, but if you uh, curl that URL, you will get uh, this looking kind of blob, which does have all of the file names in it. So you can see there's one, uh, I lost it there sub 187785.nii. Um, and you should be able to pull out from this a list of all, all of the names that match that pattern. And then you can pull down only the first 348 bytes of each of them, load them into uh, NI Babel, and then inspect sort of the dimensions of the thing to figure out which are sort of the correct images. Can you get back to that yes, yes, I can. Yes. 
you probably need to. Well, actually, it should yeah, it should be. just work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it works. Yeah. I do that all the time. Where I kind of install something and then import it immediately. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, yeah, and if you're having problem or if you're running into issues, like come, uh, just raise your hand. Let let us know. So. And thanks for uh, dealing with our <laughs> debugging <laughs> live here. So for a quick update on our progress here, is, that, is anyone, anyone doing on this, if at all? Sorry to hear that. So um, one thing you can do for some of this is uh, you first want to get uh, the raw kind of page. So that would be you could just curl down that base URL there. I actually think I encoded this as a, yeah. Can you make the font bigger? I sure can. You want to show the other command? Hmm? Oh, yeah, base URL. Yeah. Right, yeah. So then if you have this really long, painful string like this, but you know that the files look like um, somewhere there, you can try to use XML, but XML is horrible. So <laughs> um, you could also use a regular expression to scrape over that and pull anything that matches a certain pattern. So then that's sort of the list of files that match that. So now you might want to try just like downloading one of those, which would be to grab the first 348 bytes, so I'll clear that out, um, save it to the same output file, concatenate, or just you know put together the base URL and then the path of a single file just to kind of test it out. Seems to work. You import an eBabel. Um, you can load that file. And then if you explore some of the different options here, you might see this header thing. <coughs> yeah, back there. Yeah, so the question is about uh, why, why shouldn't you use a path string here? Well, yeah, so the, the answer is basically that it's a URL, so it's not really a path in a normal way. And the second is that you're, you're just passing it back down to a command, a subprocess command, and so it's going to get turned back into a string anyways. So you don't really need the path object. Yeah. Having said that, what, um, you know, as you go along on this, you might, you would maybe curl it down using just, you know, the, just a string because you want to pass that to curl. But then in terms of loading the file after you have it there, you could first make it a, a pathlib path, load it from that, and then depending on the results of like how you're inspecting it, then use pathlib of that file to move it or change it or mark it or delete it or you know. So you can work that into the the process. I should probably just close that. Right? Yeah, I think so. Right. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna keep working on this like at lunch, so if people wanna uh, um, on this contrived example that we created. Um, <laughs> but you want things to work. Um, so that, um, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we know it's like a lot of information just to dump into people's heads, um, but we appreciate you guys uh, kind of toughing it out with us. Um, we also, um, there's a bunch of stuff we haven't covered. Um, uh, there's, there's even some more new syntax probably that I've forgotten about. <laughs> um, but we're here all week and we're happy to help you answer questions. If you have a certain thing you like to do and you just want it to, you think it could work a little better, or you want to try, see what it would look like on conch, please like stop us anytime. We have stickers on our badges and you probably would recognize at this point. Um, we also have stickers up front, so feel free mm -hmm. to take as many as you want of those. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming and trying out conch and hopefully you know, it improves your life in some meaningful way. So, uh, and then yeah, we'll be around and open bug reports, find us on Gitter, uh, open issues, contribute, we're a friendly community. So thank you so much, everybody. Thanks.